All right. So uh, thank you once again for everybody at the, the Jinzai Tendai Temple to allow me to present today's topic. Um, I'm a bit, uh, I'm excited and not excited for two reasons on this topic, because uh, it kind of ended up that last week's presentation, um, I think it was Kaiden that did it, if I remember correctly. Um a lot of people had questions at the end, and at the end of the question, a lot of the question was actually on that concept of purity. And it's kind of funny because we've decided, Munchin Sensei, that I would be talking about this before last month. So I think it's uh, it's probably fresh in people's mind, and it seemed to have to have been a topic that people had a lot of interest on. So I'm excited to be able to share what I what I've learned about this uh, topic. Um, but the thing that I'm a little less excited about about this topic is that. This topic really brought back the the academic in me, in that uh, the way that I uh, what I love to do is the part of I engage in in my own work in my academic work and everything is that I uh, when there's a topic the question I'm asking myself is what do the ancestors say about this and what is found in the texts about that kind of stuff and then I go and find the particular passages that talk about this and you know translate them and then talk about okay this is what this person's saying about it this is and I'm trying to see if there's consistency or differences like across time and all that kind of stuff so what I'm trying to say is that this presentation is going to be maybe a little more kind of textual than I normally do uh, but I try to really make it more to the, uh, still stick to going straight to the point. And uh, although there's so many passages on so many of these authors that I'm talking about today that is on purity, I try to select like like very key ones uh, to focus on. But yeah, so today's presentation might be a little more academic than what we're used to. So I apologize for that in advance. But uh, I think it's a topic of interest. And I really wanted to give people the opportunity to know what the ancestors say on this well what they say through my translation so you have to also take it with a grain of salt but okay so today's the structure is going to look like this i'm just going to give a bit of uh, etymologies we're not going to go very deep into this uh, what i mean by that is really looking at what are the words that are being used in, in sanskrit and in japanese or chinese when we talk about purity it's, it's very simple uh just so that you have the vocabulary if you want to look it up yourself uh, then I'm going to focus on two authors, on Asai and Dogen, and what they have said uh, on purity. Like Monchin Sensei introduced me earlier, Asai, Dogen, and Nichiren are the three people, three of the some people that I translated in my dissertation. So I, I like to go back to these people because I think they have good stuff to say, but also it's uh, it makes my life a bit easier to go back to the text that I already know. Um, but I also today go into talking about what is said on in the awakening of faith which is one of the sutras uh there's there's a lot of different kind of metaphors in there and i'm going to talk about three of them today because they all focus on purity and we're going to all put all of this together and talk about so what did the ancestors tell us about teach us about purity and can that be useful to us so first of all the the um, Words that we're using when we talk about purity, the way it's translated is shuddha or vishuddha. And it's translated, purity is, is it's it causes a lot of issue to translate it in English as purity. It's kind of a bait, to be honest with you, because uh, it can be, you know, purity, but like cleanness, untainted or anything that's devoid of dust. So it's not necessarily pure always in the sense that we understand it to be. Uh, in the Japanese uh, context, the old pronunciation of the old kanji would be shoujo. I think in modern Japanese, they tend to say seijo for the same kanji. Uh, it means like pure or cleanse, clean, clear, uh, but also used in the context of uh, exercise. So the first kanji, sho or sei, is, can mean this, but the second one also means the same thing. So it's just two different kanji that means uh, like purify, purity, cleansing, these kind of stuff, and they put it together and it makes it uh, the more complete word. You can also oftentimes see uh, just one of these kanji in a compound, like in uh, like jo shin, like a pure heart, you would have like the jo of the kanji and then the shin of the heart. Uh, so these are the words that we're talking about when we translate as purity. It's shuddha or vishuddha and shoujo in Japanese. And I don't know the Chinese pronunciation of, of the kanji, unfortunately. 
Okay, so first of all, let's dive into ASI. And the text I'm talking about is the Kozen Gogokuron, which is one of his major work. And I'm only going to provide one passage from ASI. So this passage is the following. So again, it is said in the Mohodzikwan. So that is the uh, the the text from Ji that you know the founder of well, one of the technical third patriarch of Tendai Buddhism. Uh, so it is said that in this text, it says, "Freed from the demerit of the obstacles of the Buddha path, the precepts are pure. One pointed concentration manifests before one's eye, and stillness and insight develop. As a result of acting precepts with purity." The roots of one-pointed concentration manifest before one's eye, and as a result of the purity of oneness with the precepts, the king of one-pointed concentration manifests before one's eyes. So I highlighted passages here that point to what I believe is the key insight that I personally got from translating Asai's work on and the passages that talks about purity like this one. So the first insight that I can draw from this is that purity is attained when a being is freed from the obstacle to the Buddha's path. So there's obstacle to the Buddha's path. And when you're freed from the obstacle, then it is deemed that you have attained purity. And what are the obstacles? In this context of this quote, it was the delusions or ignorance, confusion, uh, moha or chi or ji. Uh, so, and the, basically, which is the third of the, uh, the three poisons. So this passage was specifically referring to these as the obstacles. But also, all good things happen as a result of having attained purity first. So if we go back to the passage real quick, it said the, the second part where it's all like said, as a result of acting with purity, this happened. As a result of the purity of oneness, then this thing happened. So in other words, the good things that happen happened because you have attained purity first. So purity is more importance in the order of things than the thing actually because the things the good things that are happening which in this th in this case would have been like you know like a, a good meditation or having a particular kind of state of mind happens when you've achieved purity first and again purity is being freed from the obstacle to the buddha's path So this was the passage that I focused on for, for ASI. Um, now I'm switching up to Dogen, which has three passages that I found that I think are very important. The first passage in the Shobogenzo, Dogen says, in the practice place of Buddha ancestors, certainly this conduct of cleansing exists. It is the perpetual etiquette of the various Buddhas. It is the ordinary custom of various ancestors. It is not specifically the etiquette of this world's various Buddhas. It's the etiquette of the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. It's the etiquette of the Buddha of pure lands and impure lands. So here, the what do Buddhas do? They cleanse. This is the etiquette. This is what they do. Buddhas cleanse. And cleansing is, again, the concept in the words is purity, purify. They purify. What do Buddhas do? They purify. And it's not just in this world, in every world, no matter where you go, what Buddhas do is purify. So that's the first passage. The second passage is in water, there certainly, uh, certainly there is no primordial purity at all. There is no primordial non-purity. I'm going to skip because it's a bit of a, uh, of a longer one. But in water, there is no purity and non-purity. In the body, there is no purity and non-purity yet. The various dharmas truly are just like this. The teachings of the world-honored Buddha is just like this. It is not that water is employed to purify the body. Upon fulfilling the duty of the Buddha Dharma by means of the Buddha Dharma, then this proper etiquette exists. This is called cleansing. So this is, is, is it comes from a fascicle that's it's called, I think it's either cleansing or it's about like washing the face. And it's like the various ways you go about washing the body. Like you wash the body this amount of time in this particular way. Then you apply the like uh, fragmented oils to make sure that it, it smells good and everything. And basically what Dogen is saying is, you know, if you take water to purify something, it's not because water is inherently pure. And then there's this other thing that's not pure and water is watching it, is washing it. What you're doing, you're just performing this etiquette of cleansing. 
you're using water to cleanse, not because, so what's important is not that water is pure and the other thing isn't, is that cleansing is happening at all. And water is a means that can achieve that. But what is important is just reproducing this etiquette of the Buddha of cleansing. The last passage is this one. As a result of this, when practice realization happens, there is the surpassing of purity. There is the passing through non-purity, and there is the falling off of no purity and no non-purity. So putting these three passages together, the insights that I got from Dogen is, are these ones. In the ultimate sense, there is no such thing as purity and impurity. Purity is provisional, provisionally useful as a skillful means. Purification manifests the Buddha's conduct of cleansing in the world. So what, does Buddha, what do Buddhas do? They purify. They cleanse. So import, it's important to continue doing just like the Buddha did, just like the Buddhas are doing, and continue cleansing. But when you reach a certain point... So purification guides being to awaken to the truth of emptiness, to reality, where all provisional truth have been cleared. So purification, it's it's useful. Like you practice cleansing, just like the Buddhas did, and just like the Buddha did in, in his life uh, as the, the historical Buddha. You practice cleansing, you practice cleansing, and eventually you, you reach that point that when the cleansing has happened and you've got rid of the three poisons, you see reality clearly. And when you see reality clearly, then you're kind of you're you've reached the ultimate sense. And in that ultimate sense, you realize that purity and impurity is not actually a thing, but it's useful to get you to where you need to be. So these were the insights that I found in Asai and Dogen specifically. So now my what I thought would, would be a, a fun exercise to do would be, okay, if I pick up a sutra, which is pretty central to Mahayana Buddhism, and try to see what is being said over there, does it accord with Asa and Dogen? Is it different? Is it the same? So I chose the awakening of faith uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of it is because it, there's an English translation available, so people can go and dive in uh, into the text uh, more easily. I chose the Hakida translation. I, I have the source at the end of the presentation. Uh, for those who wonder, we'll maybe watch the video on YouTube. Thanks, Jake, for putting the videos on YouTube. Always a shout out. Uh, it's going to be on page 46 and 47. So the first um, story that is being told around purity is the waves in the ocean. So it kind of goes like this. This is one. It's a longer passage. I trunk it down to what I think is the core. This is like the relationship that exists between the water of the ocean and its wave stirred by the wind. Water and wind are inseparable, but water is not mobile by itself. And if the wind, if the wind stops, the movement ceases. Likewise, man's mind, pure in itself, is stirred by the wind of ignorance. Yet mind is not mobile by nature. And if ignorance ceases, the continuity of deluded activity ceases. The second passage is the dust on the mirror, which is, again, a very famous uh, Buddhist, um, I don't know, is it parable? I don't know if it's the right word in English, but story, uh, allegory to, uh, to describe uh, cleanliness and all these kind of things. So the dust on a mirror here, it says, it is like a mirror that is free from defiled objects. So dust. This can be said because the non-empty state of or of, of it's supposed to be of original enlightenment, is genuine, pure, and bright, being free from hindrances. Because the essence of enlightenment is free from defiled objects, so dust, it, is univers it universally illumines the mind of man and induces him to cultivate his capacity for goodness. And the last passage, the gem, um, it's also, I think it's commonly known as like the gem in the mud or something like that. I just chose the gem. It says, just as a previous gem is bright and pure in its essence, but is marred by impurities, so is man. Even if a man meditates on suchness, unless he makes an effort to be permeated by it in various ways, by applying expedient means, he certainly cannot become pure. 
since the state of impurity is limitless, it is necessary to counteract and purify it by means of the practice of all kinds of good deeds. So I think the some of the way that sometimes this this uh, this story is being uh, told, uh, maybe in different translation, is like you know you have you have like a jewel and it's like there's mud that accumulates on top of it. Like the, it's like a you know it's like if you excavate. Um, jewels it's like it come it's like you have to like break the rock and then you break the rock and then it's like come um, it's like diamonds there's different levels of purities you have to kind of clean it to kind of get to the core but at the end of the day uh, the gem is always pure it's just that there's layers around it that you kind of have to chip away to be able to get there so what are the insights that I found from these stories in the awakening of faith first of all all beings already are gems, mirrors, or oceans. But we are covered with karmic inheritance that needs to be removed in order to re-experience our pureness, clearness, or stillness. So we're all already pure, clear, still, etc. But because of many different circumstances, because of karma, because of our own minds, because of the three poisons, because of so many things, we either forgot about it or we were not able to reconnect or re-experience this pureness that we all beings inherently have. Um, so what we got to do, we got to clear these layers. We got to purify these layers that all doesn't allow us to, I guess, reconnect with that, um, that inherent purity that we have to kind of go back to the, to the source, go back to the beginnings. And um, so yeah, so that's the first insight. The second insight is when we have removed the three poisons from our kokoro, so our heart, mind, spirit, so our entire being at different levels. So when we have removed the three poisons from our kokoro and therefore are pure, our actions are endowed with wholesomeness. So our actions become good. So the actions become good when our heart, our kokoro, our heart, mind, spirit has been removed, has been cleared off of the three poisons. That's how you have good actions. So these are the insights that I found in the awakening of faith. So bring it all together. What do the ancestors teach us about purity? And the ancestors here in this case is Asai Dogen and awakening of faith. This might be different. Uh, sources out there, but these are one I focus on today. So what do the ancestors teach us about purity? So purity is a skillful means used to inspire beings to replicate the conduct of the Buddhas. And what if the con what is the conduct of the Buddhas is getting rid of the three poisons from which suffering results. What are the three poisons? The first one, desire, greed, avarice. Second one, hatred, antipathy, anger, hostility. The third one, delusion, ignorance, confusion, folly. So just like, and also, the thing that's important to remember about purity is that just like any other skillful means, a practitioner will eventually overcome it to realize that in reality or emptiness, there is no such thing as purity and impurity. So purity is important. Purity is, is actually the core, according to what all, to what, the, the awakening of faith is saying, but also Asai and Dogen, basically the teachings of the Buddha is about clearing yourself of the three poisons. The core of everything we do, no matter what you do, whether it's meditation, whether it's uh, repentance uh, rituals, whether it's um, washing your body, all these kinds of things, everything that you do is about purifying. What are you purifying? You're purifying your kokoro, so heart, body, and, and spirit. You're purifying all of these things to get rid of the three poisons, because it's when you've gotten rid of the three poisons that suffering ends for you, but you also, you don't create action. You don't do actions that generate suffering for others as well anymore. And this is the core of the Buddhist teachings. So in a nutshell, Purity is pretty much all that the Buddhist teachings are about in the practical sense. Whatever you do, it's supposed to help you get rid of one of the three poisons. And if it's helping you getting rid of one of the three poisons, it means you are purifying yourself. So the teaching is about how to purify 
your kokoro and how to teach others how to do so for themselves as well. So Buddhism is all about, it's actually all about purity in that sense. So is it useful to us to understand what the ancients have said about purity? Well, it is useful if we don't get caught in the webs of language and remember what the term is ultimately encouraging us to do in practice, which is clear your kokoro of the three poisons so that your actions be wholesome and have positive results that benefit all beings. It's not useful to get caught into the discussions of purity and not purity, and is it intrinsic, is it not intrinsic, is it connected to Atma? Like, yeah, these are all amazing philosophical questions to, to engage with. And trust me, I'm the first one to throw myself in these conversations. I it's I love it. So, uh, But at the end of the day, it's not very useful because it's this is the provisional truth. We're all operating in these discussions. We're all operating in the provisional realm. And once we are able to practice and pure, therefore purify our, our, our kokoro of the three poisons, and we reach that place where we can see things clearly and are operating outside of you know the provisional space, then we realize that purity and impurity actually is not really a thing. It's useful. It's very useful to help us get to where we need to be as a concept, as a teaching to guide us. But at the end of the day, there is no such thing as purity and impurity. So let's not get caught into language. We just got to practice and do continue doing what we can to get rid of the three poisons in our body so that our actions can benefit all beings. So how do we purify ourselves of the three poisons? Follow the Buddhist teachings. Whether it's the Eightfold Noble Path or meditation or washing rituals as the passage that I put from Dogen or it's repentance rituals that you can do as well, regardless of which way that works, these are all, these are all methods, these are all means to be able to clear ourselves, clear our heart, mind, and body of the three poisons. So, and the Buddhist teachings are full of different methods, different means, and Tendai embraces all of these different approaches of whatever works for you to clear yourself of the three poisons, do this because that's the one that works for you. What matters is at the end of the day, we can all come to a place that the three poisons don't exist in our Kokoro, and we can all cross to the other shore with the Bodhisattvas. Lastly, is it useful? Yes, because you can become an example for others to be inspired by so that they too will want to get rid of suffering in their lives and those around them. So it's like preach by example, right? So by practicing purification, by seeking to clear your heart and mind of the three poisons, you start, you're, you're doing these things, you're doing this ritual and you're acting from a place of of uh, purity, right? You're, you're acting from a place where the three poisons have been cleared then it, then people see the beneficial the benefit action that comes out of it then you'll become a, a beacon of light for other people right you will people will be wow i i want that too like I, you will become you will be in, people will be inspired by the way that you behave they'll be inspired by the results of your actions that benefit not just yourself but all beings and therefore it's uh you'll motivate you'll inspire them to also engage in that path so preaching by example um, is also a great way to, you know, to get people to want to be interested to learning more about it. And then you present to them the Buddhist teachings, which are full of different examples of how they can go about doing that for themselves and they can figure it out for themselves what works for them. So I think that overall, um, at least to me, um, doing this this research and engaging with purity as the core of of all that I studied for a long time, uh, I would say that the concept of purity is extremely useful to us today. It's very important because it it's it also forces us to remember. In my mind, uh, I'm not talking for uh, Monchin Sensei or the entire uh, Tendai community. I'm talking for me, but kind of like remembering what the teachings are all about. You know, it's uh, it's about getting rid of the three poisons so that suffering can be eliminated. And how do you get that? You clear your mind. You clear your heart, and that's what is meant by purity. Uh, it's doing the clearing. Just keep doing the clearing, whatever that looks like for you, um, as long as it allows us to get rid of the three, three poisons. So I think it's extremely useful. And I think it's actually the, I would say, the core of what Buddhism is about. So that is my presentation for today. These are my sources. And yes, I'm doing a plug to my dissertation right there. So yay me.
Um, outside of that, I also use the uh, Hakeda text, the Awakening of Faith, uh, that you can get for yourself. Just for reference, for if people have seen it online, it's the one that looks like this. So these are the sources that I use today. I'm going to put that later. And that is the end of my presentation. And I will now be taking uh, questions or comments. Uh, let me just make a, a few really brief comments before we do questions and answers. Sensei is there, is he? Uh, he is not. Okay. Um, and that is, uh, and I, Maxime, I thought your presentation was, was very good. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, all of your materials were what I'll refer to as, as um, medieval Japanese um, sources, mm -hmm. and with the exception of Waking of Faith which is a Mahayana text. And we have to keep in mind that Nikaya Buddhism, early Buddhism, purity had an even more profound um, meaning in the sense that that's exactly what one did through one's lifetimes in order to attain awakening. It was the purification, it was the, and in that case, it was viewed as the uh, elimination of defilements and obscurations. Uh, that was the, the, the very literal, but it shows you the evolution of the idea of purity from the Kaya Buddhism into Mahayana Buddhism, where in Mahayana Buddhism it becomes more processual as opposed to uh, descriptive. And I think that teaches us something about both uh, the Mahayana uh, way of looking at the world as well as how the evolution, use thinking of Qi Gi's um, uh, four, fourfold teachings, uh, how the evolution of the teaching occurred from the Nikaya to the Mahayana. And I would suggest that the Mahayana uh, view of this is much more uh, consistent with what we might learn from it today as opposed to the Nikaya Buddhism, which viewed it as just elimination of obscurations and defilements. And one did that lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Um, whereas the Mahayana is dealing much more with the process of how do we um, not just eliminate the defilements, but actually uh, negotiate, navigate the world, how do we cope with the world uh, today, and that, but that's going back to the three basic teachings of the three, of the three poisons and how do, we, how do we deal with those three poisons. So I think that your presentation was a wonderful example of how the Mahayana was dealing with that and how that is much more applicable to today's world than the Nikaya view, which was dealing with it in a way that was more consistent with the Vedic view, it was still, it was still, still dealing with it in a, Vedic, in a Vedic fashion. So I'll just leave that there and see if there's people who have questions. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording. And we'll stop the recording.